Good morning, everyone. It's fantastic to be here. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Thank you for this invitation to be here. <clears throat> and thank you for saving the most important meal of the day for the Leader of the Opposition. There are three more sitting days before Parliament rises for the winter recess, for who's counting. The winter break will give us a chance uh, to go to a home, to our communities, to get out and about and around the whole nation, in fact. To listen to Australians, to talk to them about their hopes and aspirations as well as the challenges they're facing in their lives. To measure our policies and our ideas against their priorities. It is a kind of a mid-year stock take for all of us in public life. I think this annual CEDA conference is also an occasion for a national stock take. A time to look at uh, the big questions, a time for a broader look. A chance for all of us to reflect on the state of the economy, the shape of our society and the health of our democracy. And the opportunity perhaps to turn the temperature down a bit. To step back from that day-to-day -day verbal jousting, which probably doesn't contribute too much in question time to the sum of human experience, and instead start to answer the dissatisfaction in the Australian public about the state of politics that it is now. The opportunity to move away from the slogans and the dumbing down of the debates to who said what, when, and the gossip. It is the over-horizon view, as our chair said today. And this is what motivates me, the over-the-horizon view. And of course, transitioning from the old to the new, the theme of this conference, I believe is squarely one of the key questions for the next election in the people of Australia. Preparing the Australia of 2015 for the Australia of 2025 and 2035. It is all about the future. Australians, businesses, understand already the trends which will define the next 10 and 20 years, regardless of who's in power. We know the trends which are underway, the tectonic plate movements which are irresistible, the transformation of the rise of Asia, the seismic shift of digital disruption, the move to a low pollution economy, the inexorable march of women through the institutions of Australian life to true equality, and of course the demographic changes, two generations of retired Australians alive at the same time. These are the facts, ladies and gentlemen. Asia, the digital economy, energy efficiency and sustainability, the equal treatment of women, growing older. The question is, this is not a labour list, these are the non-negotiables. They don't align with any electoral calendar, and they don't stop for any partisan agenda, any short-termism. We can't hold them back, we don't wish to wish them away. The challenge in our public life is not what the trends are and making the decisions about that, it's what will we do about them. The challenge is if we were to meet here again in 10 years and 20 years' time, could we look back to 2015 and say, for instance, that the 2015 budget was that magic moment where we set Australia up for the next decade or two decades, and if the decisions we make in this parliament do not pass that reunion party of 10 and 20 years' time, looking back, did we get things done this year? Was that the year we decided to step up? The question of these trends is, will they shape us or do we shape them? Do we ride the waves? Or were we left waiting out the back? This was the focus of my budget reply speech, and you can still see it on iView if you feel so motivated. But I wanted, in that budget reply speech, I didn't just want to be negative about the government. That's an important component. To do otherwise would have let my team down. But much, much more importantly in my mind was that the budget reply has to be starting to outline a response, outline a response, a reaction. To get over the top of the short-term election pitch and deal with more than just dealing with the budget. A bigger conversation, a bigger direction. You and I know. You would talk at your dinner parties or with people at your school parents group 
or just with your family or your work colleagues. There is a disenchantment in Australian politics that somehow what we talk about in this parliament doesn't reflect or speak to the lives that people have. So in my budget reply speech, I said we wanted to talk about jobs. Everything for me is about the impact on jobs, keeping jobs, getting jobs, good quality jobs. And to have the jobs, you need the knowledge and the skills and be attractive for the industries of the future. We need a plan to balance our demographic change with a productivity boost. And we need to end, not talk about it, we need to end the partisan squabbling and uncertainty holding back infrastructure delivery. Encouraging investment and enhancing confidence. Now, confidence. That is the job of the national economic leaders of this nation. Build confidence. You know confidence can't necessarily be measured simply. It's almost intangible, like water you hold in your hand. It's hard to hold it there, but if you do something imperceptible, you can lose it. Confidence is what national political leaders need to be generating. I'll return to these propositions in a moment. We know, though, what is happening in the economy in terms of the broad brushstrokes. Mining investment is returning from those unprecedented highs back to a more normal level. From 8% of GDP, 8% mining investment, 8% of our total economic activity. Big story, and we should be grateful to the mining companies for what they've done. But it's at the top of the boom, that number. Now it's 2 2.5%. It's the equivalent, I would say, of a $100 billion withdrawal from a $1.6 trillion economy. That's the change in economic activity. Massive change. Massive alteration in terms of confidence, transition, and in terms of the cash flow of the nation. Mining will remain central to our exports. Our recent growth numbers, such as they were, were riding off the back of hulls full of minerals going to Asia. But I believe the overwhelming economic priority, accepting the trends that I've outlined, is to identify and develop the next engine for economic growth. If we don't have mining, what is next? Understanding those trends and forces I outlined, and underpinning all of that, the importance of confidence. Our economy is not growing as fast as we would like it. It is not going as well as we would hope. And no amount of press releases can paper over this issue. Our growth is at 2.3%, a full percentage point below trend. A full percentage point below trend. And it has been this way for a while. Our annual economic growth has been below trend for 11 consecutive quarters and all but three of the last 27 quarters. So some of this can be explained away by the global financial crisis which this nation rode better than many others. Some of it can be explained by the changes in the domestic economy and indeed periodically severe impacts of extreme weather events. But we are currently living through the longest period of below trend growth for more than 50 years. As a result of this, our unemployment, disturbingly, has a six in front of it. And it has for more than a year. Long-term unemployment is at a 16-year high. More than 188,000 of our fellow Australians have been unemployed for more than a year. Now, the orthodoxy of the last 30 years tells us things will just inevitably get better. If we look at the current situation as just a short-term challenge, that something will come along, and, of course, then that the official prescription of low interest rates to stimulate demand with some modest fiscal stimulus, that'll make sense, that's what we do. But let me suggest to you that we need to understand that a cycle of decline and growth is not inevitable in economic history. We need to make decisions now, which will set us up for the next 10 and 20 years, not the next opinion poll. We need to look at the big picture, the long run, the jobs of the future, the prosperity of the future. This morning I want to suggest to you that we need to change some of our methods, our model, our mindset. The Commonwealth needs to consider and needs to do more than consider, needs to commit to new investment 
in infrastructure, in innovation, and in education. It's not turning our back on past reforms. It's about the question of shaping new reforms for a new century. I'm a student of history. In the 1940s, John Curtin and Ben Shifley forged new reforms to win the peace and build a fairer post-war world. The Great Migration Program to the late 40s, for instance. The big infrastructure building. In 1980s, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating transformed Australia. They brought down the tariff walls to prepare us to be an international economy, not frightened of the region we live in, clinging as some sort of colonial outpost to mother country. But you can only open your economy once. Now we have to create reforms to deal with the challenges of infrastructure, innovation, inequality. Combining the egalitarian, communitarian spirit of an earlier era with market dynamism, the Asian engagement of Hawke and Keating. Once again, Australia has to make choices. We must choose to be open, not closed. We must choose renewal, not decay. Innovation, not stagnation. We engage in our region, that's our choice. And compete and succeed in the world on our terms. The truth of the matter is that many of the levers that were even available to a Labor government in the 1980s, the exchange rate, your airline, your telecommunications company, they're just not there. But there are levers available to the Commonwealth in this time we live in. Infrastructure, I submit, is one of the levers the Commonwealth can drive. Education, skills, is another lever which the Commonwealth can drive. In 2025, just 10 years' time from here, 5 million extra Australians will live in our cities. Millions more in our regions will depend upon our cities as the providers of services that they rely upon to the markets that they will sell their services and product in. It is up to the Commonwealth to use its fiscal horsepower to work with states to make our cities more livable, much more sustainable and more productive, connect them better with our regions. Australians are good at living in cities, but we need to more effectively unlock our cities and engage in our regions, and we can do this through investment in infrastructure. Substandard infrastructure costs us all. Infrastructure Australia's recent national audit shows that traffic congestion will cost the Australian economy $53 billion by 2031. And the distance between where Australians live and where we work is growing fast. Most of the new jobs are within 10 kilometres of our CBDs. Yet most of our population growth is occurring in our outer suburbs, more than 20 kilometres from the CBD. Today, nine out of 10 of us will spend more than 90 minutes a day travelling to and from work. It poses a fundamental question about the national quality of life, our lives outside of work. Do we just want to be a nation of three large mega cities on the east coast, ringed by drive-in, drive-out suburbs? Do we want to be a nation where parents are never home in time to kick a ball in the backyard to help out with the homework or share the family meal? Do we want to be a nation where the next generation of Australians feel shut out of the housing market? Infrastructure to me means new roads and public transport, new ports and bridges better social housing, smart energy grids, efficient irrigation projects, and of course, and of course, the best digital infrastructure. Yet based on the latest figures, there's been a 17.3% fall in spending on public sector infrastructure in 12 months. The latest Akamai study shows that Australia is now ranked 44th in the world for internet speeds. We would never accept being 44th in the world when it comes to sport. Why do we accept it when it comes to the digital economy? New infrastructure projects boost demand in the short term. They lift supply over the long term. They create jobs. They generate national momentum. Seaports, airports and their interaction with road and rail networks, crucial. There are opportunities before us in rail freight and export shipping. 
just look at the regional rail which has been opened in Melbourne and Victoria, which is delivering marvellous changes there. So as a nation, we need to bring major new projects to market. Too many delays, though, caused by political bickering. What will the Greens say? What will the Nats say? What will the Poles say? And bickering between different levels of government, too. High bid costs, commercial risks, forecasting errors, long procurement, uncertain processes have made new infrastructure investments less attractive to long-term equity investors, constructors, governments and financiers. Every day of inaction dents confidence, which in turn erodes trust. It undermines certainty. Certainty is the prerequisite for confidence for investors. It increases pressure on state government budgets. It is long overdue in this nation to break the political gridlock and close the infrastructure gap, and this demands a new approach. Last month, I announced Labor's plan to boost the power and the resources of Infrastructure Australia and put them at the centre of decision making. It's a plan to bring new projects to market, creating a strong and consistent pipeline to provide an unambiguous and clear signal to the market. We want to adopt the reserve bank model, an independent authority at the heart of capital investment, just as the bank is to monetary policy. You can imagine that I was more than a little bit pleased yesterday when Ross Garneau offered his support for this idea. Our model will replace the petty, narrow, short-term politics with certainty, confidence, transparency and rigour. We want Infrastructure Australia to play an active role in structuring and generating new projects. A model which ensures the projects will have the clear benefits to our cities and regions outlined and that when they do, they don't languish on the national infrastructure priority list. Let's take the politics out of infrastructure. Let's put the people, the certainty and the generational decision making back into it. We need a model that addresses the trust deficit between project proponents. Instead of politicians choosing projects based upon the electoral map and according to our two short electoral timetables, Infrastructure Australia would recommend projects based on three criteria. Does it benefit our economy? Does it benefit our community? And will it enhance the capacity of our national productivity? If we are to be truly nationally and globally competitive in the future, Australia's infrastructure needs to be benchmarked against the world's best practice in our Asia-Pacific region. And again, whilst the government didn't understand what this following sentence, I hope you do, I said that a Labor government would offer the opposition of the day a meaningful say on every infrastructure appointment. We do not need government when one mob goes in and one mob goes out. It becomes a cycle of Sicilian vendetta that anyone appointed by the previous government is viewed by suspicion by the current government and the next government views that generation. So we would invite the opposition of the day. What do you think of these names? What are your names? That's what we all want. That's what we're hungry for. Remember that dissatisfaction about the day-to-day short-termism? I'm as sick of it as you are. Bipartisanship is a word that's often invoked, often as a stick to say, you must agree with me, otherwise you're somehow not patriotic. It's something that governments love to demand. It's rarely welcome. And almost these days, uh, it doesn't always happen. I am different to the current Prime Minister in this regard. My union background shows you have to work with each other. You can sit in two corners as long as you like, but not a lot gets done, does it? You've got to bridge the gap. Bipartisanship recognises that no one point of view has a monopoly on all the good ideas. It's a recognition sometimes that the best idea that an organisation needs is often outside that organisation. You bring people of goodwill and expertise together. I'm a consensus operator. I get how it works. Now, you can't get everyone to agree all the time. I get that. But more often than not, the more cooperation and consensus you set out to achieve, the more often than not we will make generational decisions that we could reunite here in 10 years and say, well, that was right. We want enduring solutions. And when the experts at Infrastructure Australia get behind a good project like the Cross River Rail in Brisbane or the Melbourne Metro, they have the ability and the authority to broker the deal. You bring together the state and the local companies. You bring together the construction companies and the financiers, long-term investors like our super funds. You maximise the consumer and productivity benefits, you mitigate 
the project and financial risk. In turn, this means that the cost of developing the new project can be streamlined over time. Two weeks ago, our Governor of the Reserve Bank, Glenn Stevens, spoke about creating a new upside for the Australian economy. He called for an agreed story about a long-term pipeline of infrastructure projects surrounded by appropriate governance on project selection and risk sharing between public and private sectors at various stages of production and ownership. This is exactly my and Labor's plan for a stronger, more independent, more empowered infrastructure Australia. Interestingly, in the same speech, Glenn Stevens also said, physical infrastructure is, of course, only part of what we need. The confidence-enhancing narrative needs to extend to skills, education, technology, the ability and freedom to respond to incentives, the ability to adapt and the willingness to take on risk. If we accept, as I believe we all do, the technological change is going to be the number one factor in economic performance in the next decade, then the core question and defining measure of a government's economic credentials is what is being done to prepare the economy for new technology? What is being done to provide people the skills to master new technology and to encourage the innovation to deliver it? Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Siglitz puts it another way. His book talks, his new book talks about the difference between the static and dynamic efficiency in the economy. Static efficiency, he says, is the model we're all familiar with by now, reducing red tape and spending inefficiency. This is important, but it is not in itself enough. Dynamic efficiency comes from a high skill, fast adapting workforce, an economy that absorbs new technology and puts it to work, a society that values and supports lifelong learning. This is behind Labor's focus on the jobs of the future. These jobs will need new skills. Three out of four of the fastest growing occupations in Australia will require skills in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. This does not mean that everyone will grow up to become a computer programmer or a biology professor. It's about smarter farming and more advanced manufacturing. Plumbers and electricians using new technology and new efficient ways of doing business. We are not at the dawn of an information technology revolution. We're right in the middle of it. But right now, in our schools, our TAFEs, our universities, not enough Australians are acquiring these skills. We have to change it. Nations make decisions about their future. We must make a decision to change our emphasis. And it begins at an early age. Labor believes in coding, computational thinking, if you like. It should be at the core part of the national curriculum. It should be available and taught in every Australian school. When I was at school, I learned Latin. It still comes in hand every now and again. The Romans knew what they were talking about when they said, Legentum non carborundum. You can look that up, because <laughs> it's not totally polite. But if you want the next generation, it means don't let the bad people get you down. Um, not quite that. Um, if we want the next generation of Australians to succeed in the digital age, then they have to get the global language. They have to know how to code, ladies and gentlemen, how to instruct machines and program them. Once upon a time, the debate was being a high-wage economy, could we compete with low-wage economies? The competition we now need to compete in is the automated economy. How do we be the people who design and build and operate the machines? Now, it can be done. I was at Springwood Central Primary School in Brisbane. Their code club for six and seven-year-olds was full of enthusiastic, engaged students learning the skills of the future in their own time. One of the students told me that their parents thought it was a club for computer games until they came to visit one day. That's an innocent remark, isn't it? But it does nail the big truth. Coding will be the difference between Australian children growing up playing with technology or growing up with the skills to design and adapt technology. Now, CEDA's important report last week noted that as many as 40% of the jobs in Australia could be replaced by computers and automation within a decade or two. This should spur us into action. I was pleased to see our Malcolm Turnbull support our call for coding in a speech to CEDA on Friday. I hope they're listening to him and it marks a shift in government policy, or at least a willingness to take this issue seriously. And I will certainly sit down with Malcolm Turnbull or anyone else in the government who is minded to focus on the future. 
I do say this uh, briefly. Last time I asked Tony Abbott a question about coding in Parliament in primary school, he accused me of a Dickensian plan to send children off to work at the age of 11. I'm all for improving the participation rate, but we don't need to have these mocking debates. Let's investigate the ideas. Now, of course, teaching coding is only the beginning of the story. We need more Australians to fall in love with science and maths and IT and school and study these subjects at TAFE and at university. We need to back up our hard-working STEM teachers to have the support and resources they need to get kids hooked on science. That's why Labor will boost the skills of 25,000 current primary and secondary teachers with new professional development funding. We'll create 25,000 teaching scholarships for science and technology graduates. We'll write off the hex debts of 100,000 science, technology and engineering math students in the next five years if we are elected. And we will encourage more women to study, teach and work in these fields. We understand that this nation cannot go wrong by investing in its teachers. And for Australians eager to turn good ideas into thriving businesses, we'll establish a $500 million innovation investment fund in line with the model that supported Seek, Pharmaxis, Bionomics, Alchemia, Spinifex and BTS. As well as working with banks to create a partial guarantee scheme to provide microfinancing for startups. This is how modern labour engages with the market. We will create and underpin markets, we'll till the soil for success. We'll have more to say about this in the months ahead. But we certainly intend to make our science future one of the key propositions at the next election. A competition, ladies and gentlemen, who has the best policies for science and research and its applications is no bad thing for the Australian people. But we are at the end of the biggest mining investment boom in our history. So we have to secure the next wave of prosperity and jobs. And this will depend upon our investment in our best natural resource, the skills and smarts of the Australian people. So this morning, ladies and gentlemen, I've said to you that we believe a new investment in education, a new model for infrastructure, new support for innovation, and a new focus on growth industries. That's how we win the future. It's how we will smooth the transition from the old to the new economy. And the sooner we make this shift, the sooner we start building for the long term, the better. Have a nice morning. Thank you.